In this lecture, I'd like to discuss the difference between safe and unsafe languages. Here's a C program. On line two, we allocate um, an integer on the heap. Uh, that's then held by a pointer, uh, P. And um, we then initialize that pointer. So here's our object on the heap. We have the pointer P. Um, which is on our stack, and that's referencing this element of memory. And you can see we're putting in this, you know, the number um, about 2 billion. And what's then happening on line uh, 5 is that we're going to print out the value that we store. Star P dereferences P, that'll give me the value 2 billion. And now I'm going to convert that to a float. If you remember from your systems class, 32-bit floating point numbers have less precision than integers. So the number that I get out here may have a little loss of precision. But that's not a total disaster. Instead, on line 6, what I'm going to do is take the reference to P, this value here. Instead of treating it like a reference to a integer value, I'm going to treat it like a reference to a floating point value. Um, and then I'm going to dereference it. In this case, no conversion is going to happen. And instead, the bit pattern stored here will be simply interpreted as a floating point number. In this case, the output we get will be as follows. What we've got here is the output of the converted floating point number. So again, note that it's not quite exactly the same. Here I had 6789 at the end, here it's 6768. That's actually due to a loss of precision in the least significant bits. On line 6, however, I print out the interpretation of this bit string as a floating point number. And I can't quite count that high. I don't know what it is, but it's certainly not the right number. Um, and just to make matters worse, let's let's continue. So let's take um, an integer and a string. This is a C string. And let's multiply them together. So multiplying a string by an integer, of course, doesn't make any sense. But what I'll do is simply cast the string to a long. You might wonder what happens. Do I get the number 3? No, I don't. Um, I get some number that's actually the address of the string in memory. If we run the program multiple times, we'll actually get different values for this. And the reason this is happening is because of address space randomization. What, what's happening here is every time I run the program, the operating system is loading in the heap in different places so that the numbers or the addresses of the heap are sort of difficult for an attacker to predict. More about that in a minute. What we're seeing here is what's called unsafe access. So I have a memory location where I'm writing data at a certain type, like a character array or um, an integer, and then the same memory location is being written out in a way that violates the integrity of the program in some way. So it, either we don't have permission to read that area, or we're simply interpreting the bits in an in the incorrect way, such as taking a, a character array and trying to treat it like a string. This kind of unsafe access does not happen in a language like Scheme. Scheme prevents this kind of un unsafe access by throwing an exception Here's an attempt to add a string and an integer, and you can see Scheme gives me a dynamic error. There are lots of ways to violate safety in C. Let's just walk through some of them. One thing we can do is violate the bounds of an array. So here I have a floating point number f initialized to 10. I have an array a also initialized to 10 and I have a short i initialized to 10. What I'm going to do is just print these values out three times. And in between, I'm going to update illegal values of the array. So first, we'll go to a minus 1. And then we'll go past a0 into a1. 
Depending upon the layout of memory, I'll either affect F or I in each case. When I ran this earlier today, this is the output I got on Ubuntu. So you can see here, initially, everything is as we expect, 10, 10, 10. So F is 10, A is 10, I is 10. After I updated A of negative 1, it ended up changing the variable i. So what that tells us is that i was stored beneath a in memory. Um, instead, if I go above a, I get to f. And you can see that when I change a of 1, I ended up changing um, the variable f. So we get a different result printed out. Note that in both cases, the result is um, not what I'm expecting. I'm expecting. Um, I don't know, 2 billion or something. Um, and we're definitely not getting the right values out. So here I'm using the fact that C doesn't check array bounds to update memory that I shouldn't have access to. I can also violate safety in C by aliasing a pointer on the stack. So here I have a stack allocated variable x and an alias y. Note that when I create this kind of um, alias, it's not an alias at all. This is a copy. So the value of x is copied into y. And in this case, c will do a conversion because c knows that integers and doubles have different representations in the memory. If instead I take the pointer p, which is note has type double here, and have it point to the integer value that I stored. Um, in this case, when I dereference the double, it's going to interpret this string of bits as a double. Um, and the result is not what I'm going to want here. Indeed, what I get out is some rubbish. You can do a similar kind of aliasing trick on the heap. And this often happens with what are called dangling pointers. So in this case, I'm going to um, allocate a integer on the heap. And I'm going to reference that by a pointer called IP. So IP is going to reference that location. I'll put 10 there. And um, then what I'm going to do is free this location. What does free do in C? You know, all it does is it means that that location may be used for a subsequent allocation. So when I subsequently allocate a floating point number, it's very likely that this floating point number will be allocated to point to the thing that I just freed. And now if I assign 10 to the floating point number, of course what I'm going to get is a different bunch of bits here. I can then try to interpret that using my old integer pointer, and what I get is uh, chaos. My floating point number that I'm referencing here is indeed 10, because I was storing 10 as a floating point number. But the old stale pointer was still around, and it got some absolute trash out. Um, why is this happening? Well, you can see that, in fact, it is true that the diagram I've drawn is correct. FP and IP are pointing to the same address in memory. We can also play this game with function pointers in C. So here's two functions, one called unsafe command, one called safe command. And what I'm going to do is create a pointer here called C to point to the safe command. When I invoke it, I expect the safe command to execute. Hooray! Um, However, with pointers in C, I can do something called pointer arithmetic. So what I'm going to do is just move this pointer a little bit. I'm going to move it to be the difference between the positions of these two pointers, the safe command and the unsafe command. And so as a result, C will now point to the unsafe command. And so when I run it the second time, I get, ouch. This is worse if I have functions with parameters. So here, same game, but I have a floating point command and an integer command. Initially, I will store uh, the integer command into a variable of the function type, which expects integers. 
I can then create an integer and invoke the function with the integer. And of course, I'll get the right result. But then if I move the pointer to point to the wrong thing, well, then I'm going to end up with a bad interpretation of that bit string. And so you can see here again, I will print out some crazy interpretation of the numbers. Um, it's worth pointing out that types in C may be difficult to read. Um, there are actually tools that can help this. So the way I recommend you read types in C, it's sort of a spiral. You look at the variable being declared and then you sort of spiral around. So in this case, C is a pointer to a function that expects an integer and returns void. Unsafety is well known to cause security problems. For example, buffer overflows. Buffer overflows exploit the lack of array bounds checking. Java and many other languages, but I'll pick Java because it's familiar. Java was designed to be safe. And what does that mean? It means that they had to leave a lot of things out of the language and impose certain restrictions um, in order to avoid this kind of unsafety that we see in C. In particular, Java disallows pointers into the stack. It disallows pointer arithmetic. It disallows explicit free operations. And it imposes checks on array bounds and checks on potentially unsafe casts. For example, bounds checking in Java causes this program to throw an exception because negative one is not a valid index. Um, we would also get an exception if we were to try to access element four because this is also not a valid index. The valid indices here will be zero, one, two, three. Casts are also checked in Java in the case that they might produce an error. Here I've got three classes A, B, and C. Uh, A, you can think of as animals, B is birds, C is cats, and I'm going to create a uh, function here which takes a bird. Um, here's a function that takes an animal, and what we're trying to do here in this function is uh, treat the bird like an animal. What we're trying to do in this case is treat the animal like a bird. Now, it's always valid to treat a bird like an animal, but the reverse is not always valid because the animal may not be a bird, it may be a cat. And so this program here, when we try to run function G on a cat, gives us an exception because it says, I'm sorry, cats and birds are different. Casts in C++ are like casts in C by default. And in order to get this kind of checked behavior, you have to use some fancy wizardry that was added into the language later. These are called dynamic casts, which you can look at here. Array assignments are checked in Java as well. My array here of birds, and I'm going to have a vari two variables referencing that. So the variable B of type, uh, sorry, BS, of type B array, that's referencing it. And I have the t a variable AS of type A array, which is also referencing the same uh, array. So this is an alias where A's and B's both reference the same location. Um, this is fine if you think about you know, putting in birds and taking out animals, um, but it's tricky the other way around. If I put in animals, I need to be careful to make sure I'm only putting in uh, birds and not, for example, a cat. Um, and so Java will produce an exception on line nine here if I try to put a cat into the animal array. This is what the output will look like. This is actually a design flaw of Java, and we'll talk more about this in a later lecture when we talk about generic types. Because systems languages require access to the low-level details of the machine, systems languages are, by design, unsafe. And this includes assembly languages, C, C++, Objective-C, and uh, C-sharp's unmanaged facilities. 
Most other languages we call application languages don't require safety, and they're sort of intended to be safe, at least recent ones. And this includes Java, Scheme, JavaScript, Python, and the managed part of C Sharp. Just now we're seeing systems languages which are intended to work in a predominantly safe way. And so the idea of these languages, they're sort of following C Sharp's idea of managed and unmanaged code. So there's, or in Java, it's the Java native interface. So you can write C and sort of plug it into Java. So that code is not safe, but what you're writing in Java is supposed to be safe. Likewise in C Sharp, the managed code is safe, the unmanaged code is not. And this distinction is becoming popular in systems languages now. Uh, Rust developed by Firefox and Go, developed by Google, um, are both languages that are attempting to have the efficiency of, efficiency of C while providing a safe environment. Dynamic checks help a language prevent security flaws, but the overuse of dynamism can cause problems to endure in our code because we're not gonna check them, so we have this dynamic error. And uh, an example of this is uh, the use of null. So Tony Hoar, who invented null, considers it his billion dollar mistake. And you can see his lecture on the subject there. And you know, you end up with this choice. Is it, it it's true, I, I guess it's better that we don't have a security hole. Um, Java forces us, you know, it, it forces checks on null. So if, if you ever try to dereference a bad pointer, you will get an exception. But if that's not you know, expected in the flow of the program, the program can just crash. And those crashes are preferable, I suppose, to security holes, um, but they're still not great. Is there no good option? We'll look at something called option types in a later lecture.